This is Newsroom. Hello and welcome from Johannesburg here in South Africa. My name, of course, is Yibney Anson. This show is always live. This broadcast from our studios here in Auckland Park. Don't forget, we're also streaming live on YouTube right now. The whole show is always available on demand on our YouTube channel. Now, today, we talk to the stupid student representative council at the University of Zulu Natal following a week of chaos and violence there. Oscar Pistorius is broke. Our question of the day relates to that. Oscar Pistorius says has no money for an appeal. What are your views on this? At SABC Newsroom, of course, that's where you tell us. We also look at the outcomes of the 14th World Forestry Congress that was concluded in Durban recently. A new albinism awareness campaign launches tomorrow, but the attacks, they continue. The Leader X Summit started at the Santon Convention Center this morning, and the Northern Cape Local Government Summit ends in Kimberley a little bit later today. But first, let's get the day's news from Anine Domel. Good morning, I'm Anine Domel. Let's take a look at the stories making headlines today. The 8.3 magnitude earthquake that struck off the coast of Chile has left five people dead and a million evacuated. The toll was given in the early hours of this morning by the country's Deputy Interior Minister, who says figures are still preliminary. The, a tsunami alert has been issued to areas including Peru, Ecuador and Hawaii. Oscar Pistorius' financial ability for a new trial is non-existent. This is according to the Paralympic athletes' legal team. In papers filed with the Supreme Court of Appeal yesterday, Pistorius' lawyer Barry Rue argued his client cannot afford a new trial. The heads of arguments were filed in response to the state's argument that the athlete should be found guilty of murder for shooting their his girlfriend, Riva Stenkamp, in 2013. Pistorius is serving a five-year sentence at the Jose Mampu prison in Pretoria. In Durban, a massive search is underway for five men who gunned down four people at the Kwamashu Men's Hostel yesterday. Three of the victims were killed instantly, while a fourth man died later. Another man suspected of being part of the gang was found dead at the scene. The motive for the attack is still not clear. Meanwhile, 11 people have been arrested and 25 firearms have been seized following yesterday morning's shooting at a Durban taxi rank. The National Prosecution Authority will not yet start criminal proceedings against government officials involved in the Al-Bashir saga. In a ruling in June, the High Court in Pretoria said government failed to comply with its order to prevent Bashir from leaving. Yesterday, the same court dismissed government's application for leave to appeal against the ruling. The ANC says the earlier ruling from the court has undermined the status of the African Union. Our view is that uh, the earlier ruling, the judgment of the court, it does undermine the status of the African Union, the AU, as a multinational institution. Because AU has the same status when it comes to immunities like any other international uh, institution, whether it's UN and so on. The United Nations Security Council has strongly condemned the detention of Burkina Faso's interim president and prime minister by presidential guard members. Presidential guard members loyal to the former Burkina Faso president detained the interim president and his cabinet yesterday. The tension of the nation's transitional leaders triggered immediate street protests outside the presidential palace. The move comes less than a month before an election. And some 4,000 refugees have entered Croatia from Serbia in the past 24 hours. This after Hungary sealed its border with Serbia. Well, remember, you can find all of those stories on our Newsroom Facebook page. Just simply search for SABC Newsroom. Of course, you can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Eben, over to you. Thanks very much, Janine. Now, this week, chaos ensued at the University of Kuzulu Natal's Westville campus as students are demanding proposed plans by the university to stop what is known as the Registration Appeals Committee process, which allows students owing money to the institution to enter into an agreement with the institution to pay their debts in installments while continuing with their studies. University management said they're currently in talks with uh, student representative council to understand the causes of the unrest and to address the student grievances. 
Other concerns include security on and off campus, as well as closure of access to the university's foundation programs. The university has since taken a decision to suspend all academic programs on all campuses. Now, from our Durban studios this morning, we are joined by the uh, university's SRC president, Ditorbe Mosana. We tried getting the university to give us their side of this story in the interview, but unfortunately, uh, they refused to join us this morning. Very good morning. Uh, very good morning to you, uh, Ditorbe. Thank you for joining us. Yes, uh, good morning, Ivan, and good morning also to the viewers back at home. Before we get into the into the detail of, of what's going on this week. You've been, you're being accused as the SRC by the students for, for not putting forward their concerns. How do you respond to that and, and is that really the case? Well, uh, I personally as the president have not had any student saying that uh, we are not putting uh, forward their concerns. Uh, as far as I know, we are putting the students' interests first rather than our own interests. So um, I disagree with that statement. Uh, the issues of the Registration Appeals Committee touches on students. The issues of batteries and non uh, policy touches on students. So um, there is no personal or, or, or issue that uh, it will serve SRC interests, but only interests of the students in, at large. What's the latest in your discussions with university management to try and to try and, uh, and put an end to what's been going on uh, on campus? Uh, well, currently, as we speak, uh, we have disengaged with the management uh, on the basis that one of our colleagues, which is the local SRC president of the Westville campus, has been arrested. And we believe that we cannot go on to into the table while we have one of our own in the prison cells. Uh, so we, we, we said up until such a point where the university will ensure that he gets proper legal representation, then we are going to disengage and we'll only sit down once uh, we have all our forces in the table. What, what's your reaction to all academic activities at the university now being halted? You know, it's... It, it, it's quite one, uh, a, a disappointment that um, it has led to this. Uh, but further to this, I, I'll just like to highlight the fact that it's been a while, it's been a number of months since we've been trying to engage university management on the issues at hand. And uh, um, a culmination of issues led to where we are. And it's unfortunate that uh, students who uh, wanted to, 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 to attend this week could not attend due to uh, uh, the arrogance of the management. But uh, on the other hand, uh, we would appeal also to the management to uh, uh, allow students or give a week in October, an additional week, so that students can continue with their academic uh, 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 load. What about the destruction of property and the violence that we've seen this week? As the SRC, you representing the students, the violence continues unabated, the university's property is being, des is being destroyed. How do you view that? Um, I'd like to say that um, as the SRC, we actually um, denounce the violent actions. We are not for uh, violent actions. And in fact, we have been trying as the SRC to cool off the situation at different levels. But it becomes a problem when the police do not allow the SRC to actually now engage with the students. Uh, whenever, as the SRC, you try to intervene and bring students together and try to address them, they disperse you. So now, uh, the, the protest action regenerates to such an extent that the SRC does not have hold of the students and their actions. So um, I'd, I would want to blame it pe uh, um, partially on the management and the police in not allowing us or interdicting us to actually address students. But so, that doesn't um, exonerate anybody. That doesn't exonerate anybody, Titobe, from destroying property, from burning cars, from burning buildings. That surely is counterproductive anywhere in the world, and it only hurts you, the students. I agree with you when you're saying that it is uh, counterproductive. 
At the same time, I'm saying that if the SRCs are not able to engage with students, then it's impossible for us to calm students down. So it is the situation that the management has put us in. I cannot go to campus as it is and address students because I'm interdicted to do so as the SRC president. So if students now are, uh, are protesting and we are unable to control them, it means that the management will have to come down and control them because I can't, because I'm interdicted. So um, at, as it is, we denounce violence, but still um, we need to, 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 to the, the university needs to consider canceling the interdict so that we can address students and control students. We, we, are not we cannot have a denouncing SRC, violence and a but. We have to find a way to stop the violence. That's the one point. But let's, let's move on and talk about transformation a little bit because the University of KwaZulu-Natal is, is, is prides itself and is known as the most transformed university on the campus. You, the students are accusing them of a lack of transformation and race being an issue. Why? Uh, Firstly, I need to say that um, although we may be called uh, the most transformed university, um, we are still struggling with things like uh, the, re the lack of uh, 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 racial integration within the university. You know, different racial groups uh, uh, are at different uh, uh, um, levels uh, engaging with one another. We don't, we don't see much of racial integration within the institution. Uh, that would be number one. And number two, in terms of, um, we, are, we have been calling sharply, if you can remember, mm -hmm. the, the, the King George statue as well. We've been saying as well that we do not uh, want that particular statue. Uh, there are a number of buildings, such as the Shepstone buildings in Howard College, the name of the uh, campus itself being Howard College. Uh, still brings uh, controversy into the university mm. that why are our buildings named in the particular manner that they are named uh, in the democracy that we are in. So really? I think part of the issues is that the naming of, the, uh, 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 of our buildings are not actually uh, 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 reflecting on the yeah. current demographics okay. of the university and of the country. Ditoba, I thank you for joining us. Just to note, talk to the students. We can't be building. You th you're, th you're talking about the names of the buildings? Well, you're burning the buildings, so the names don't matter if you're burning the buildings. Please talk to your constituency to not burn the buildings and not burn the campus. It hurts only you. Thank you for joining us. That's the SRC President Ditobo Mosane from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. We're talking, of course, about chaos that's been erupting on the campus there over, well, registration fees and the like, the spike in registration fees. Now, uh, another story in the news today, big story it is, the defense in Oscar Pastorius's case is expected to file opposing papers in the state's appeal against the Paralympians' conviction of culpable homicide. The, prosecuting wa the prosecution wants him convicted of murder, but it has emerged that the Paralympian he cannot afford a new trial, and it would be too long and complex. His lawyer, Barry Rue, argued in papers filed with the Supreme Court of Appeal yesterday. Uh, let's take a look at some, your, some of your views. Of course, uh, our question of the day relates to this. I see that Oscar Pistorius is going with the same. He didn't know it was Reva argument. Reckon State will win on murder of intruder, says Nathan Moore. Justice for Eva says, why don't Oscar Pistorius' 3,000 avid supporters each give 10,000 rand to keep Rue on for a week? Who pulled the trigger four times in a row? Hashtag no accident, says Justice for Eva. Molope Moncho says, so Oscar Pistorius will not be able to afford another trial. Justice time. Not sure if they're asking the court to drop this one or what. Don't forget our question of the day. Our question of the day relates to that story, the Oscar Pistorius story. There's the question. Oscar Pistorius has no money for an appeal in what will be the murder retrial. What are your views? At SABC Newsroom, that's where we want you to send us your views. There it is, all the detail. Interact with us on those platforms. We'll try and put it up, hopefully before the show, even tomorrow, if it is really good and pertinent and on point. Now, we move on. The 14th World Forestry Congress held in Durban last week was a major success. 
Nearly 4,000 representatives from 142 countries met on the African continent for the first time to look at the state of the world's forests and to deal with the threats. The Congress declared that the world's forests were fundamental to food security globally and an essential tool in the fight against climate change. These were just some of the recommendations that will be taken to COP21 in Paris later this year, as well as the United Nations. Uh, means of dealing with deforestation, such as land use, was also put forward at the Congress. I'm joined this morning by the Secretary General of the 14th World Forestry Congress, Mr. Trevor Abrahams. Good morning. Good morning, Evan. How are you doing? I'm very good today. Hmm. As always in the news business, things disturb one, you know, but yeah. you have to keep on going. For yourself, the dust yeah. must have settled now after well, what must have been a, quite a hectic week. The dust is settling, not quite done yet, um, you know, because the Congress is but the start of a journey. Mm. I think uh, we, we are obviously in a very happy state of mind. We had a very successful Congress, very well attended. Um, we had a huge number from Africa, 2,178 delegates from the African continent. That was 55% of the Congress, so yeah. it truly was Africa's first. And the conclusions, I think, represents a very balanced approach to looking at forests. Mm. Uh, the Durban Declaration, you know, as it spells it out, you know, it's not the kind of tree-hugging approach. It's looking at uh, social and economic development in a broader spectrum and how forest fits into that yeah. equation. The, the kind of outcomes of this Congress, now you're going to take to the United Nations, you're going to take to COP21, which is almost seen as the, the, the landmark uh, uh, the landmark meeting for climate change this yeah. year. What, what are you hoping to take forward from this Congress there? I think the first step for us is actually next week. Uh, it's the 70th UN uh, General Assembly. Part of that from Friday through Sunday is a summit on sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. This is essentially the post-2015 goals that the, the globe is setting for itself. And there are two key areas, both the 15 and 6 goal which relates to the maintenance and the, the sustainability of our natural resources. Mm. And the kind of conclusions we have that we've come from Durban, that's what we're going to be tabling at that forum. Yeah. Uh, of course, the more sexy one, of course, is the COP21. Yeah. Because I think uh, the fact that we're living climate change, I think more and more people becoming aware of it. They might not understand it. Yeah. And I think they might not even fully understand how forests absorb carbon dioxide and play a role in mitigating climate change. But that's really an interesting meeting of the COP series because I think the debate of climate change has been set aside. It's now what we do about it. Yeah, it's along with the flat earth theory, it's kind of been moved to yeah. one side. Yeah. But you mentioned that 55% of the delegates were from the African continent. Yeah. And, and, and if we look at the world's forests, mm. you know Africa is one of the, one of the last real strongholds of it. Mm. Uh, uh, the outcomes to benefit the continent from this, from this con Congress, what are you hoping and, and what are you seeing? I think Africa this time, first of all, it's the first time we've had any numbers like that at a World Forestry Congress. Mm. So, I mean, I think that, that's very pleasing. Um, also, I think a very important point this time, there's a group called the African Forest Forum, yeah. which actually organized the meeting for, for two days prior to the Congress. So, there was very good preparation this time. So, you know, they really had a sense of key issues that were confronting Africa. And so the African delegates were armed to go into dialogue and get engaged. And so I think there was a, a useful opportunity to, to get the kind of technical uh, knowledge that uh, is, you know, in other parts of the, the world, mm. engage with it and look at the key policy issues that they need to take back home to, to the country. I mean, the world for forests in Africa is changing very dramatically. Yeah. Besides deforestation and, and you know, the sort of threat of desertification happening there. Um, with economic development on the continent, there's increased demand for forest products. And you know, that's happening. If you go into some African cities where you see the new buildings built, they don't have metal yeah. scaffolding. It's wooden. It's wooden, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, what, about, what about the threat of, of the illegal timber trade, for instance? We, we see the rise of poaching, of course, yeah. and everyone's talking about poaching being Africa's big threat, but illegal timber is just as big a threat, isn't it? It's a quite a significant issue. In a number of African countries, we're having the hardwood going out simply in round wood uh, and exported, unprocessed, and largely illegal. And so one of the key issues for Africa was the question of regulation. 
um, regulation as well as tackling issues such as corruption that goes with it. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Because very often the, the counter side of this illegality is a bit of the corruption that goes where because much of Africa's forests are actually in government hands. You know, there's not that yeah. much private plantations in Africa. It's mostly in government hands. No, ab absolutely. Yeah. Taking stock of the world's forests and the Congress, where mm. we're now, mm. where do we want to be in 20 years' time when we kind of get all our ducks in a row that yeah. we've spoken about? I think we're looking for an approach by government and by communities which you know, recognize the role of forests and in its broader context. And I think that's one of the key issues that came through here. Mm. You know, and the expression was, forests is not just about trees. Yeah. That was the expression. Forests is about livelihoods, it's about climate, it's about uh, food security. Communities. And, and the balance also between forest land and agricultural land. Mm. You know, because often it was posed as an either or. You know, you often heard in the Amazon land has been cleared for agricultural purposes. And in fact, what came out of this Congress is not sort of saying, no, no, don't cut the trees. Uh, in fact, one person was provocative enough to say, save the forest, cut the tree. And what that he was trying to convey is that, you know, there's economic considerations that need to be played, but we need to do things in a sustainable manner. So the, yeah. the name of the game was sustainability. Yeah. You know, one, there's an importance for forestry, but it's sustainability. And I think the other important issue that came out was youth. Yeah. I mean, we had a very strong youth contingent, students, uh, firefighters. In fact, in the Durban Declaration, they actually recognized on a global platform yeah. that we had a model for dealing with unemployment, uh, you know, in terms of our youth. So youth was very important. Exactly. And, and then what you picked up uh, previously is the media. Yeah. That uh, we need to communicate more about the importance of forests. In fact, the, the, the phrase was, we need to take forestry out of the forests. <laughs> we need to get it. <laughs> we need to get yeah. it into the I, on t get it on the sp on the small screen. Get mm -hmm. it get it into people's consciousness. Yeah. I like the idea of getting young people involved yeah. though, because climate change is really the young mm -hmm. people's future, problem. Yeah. It's uh, the same with unemployment. Yeah. But we've run out of time, yeah. Trevor. Thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm. The Secretary General of the 14th World Forestry Congress it was held in Durban last week. It was a fantastic success, and the outcomes will be going uh, to uh, the United Nations, COP21, and elsewhere. Thank you. Thank for joining you. us once again. Thank you very much. Today's picture of the day now, well, this one comes from Linda Suhle, captioned, Migrants Riot at the Hungry Border. Now, we don't call them uh, migrants. We call them refugees because these are people that come from conflict zones in the Middle East. Uh, there you have a picture of what, is a, what was a riot on the, on the Hungarian border. Of course, they've closed their borders since yesterday. Now let's take a look at the front pages from around the globe. We start in Europe. The Times reports that the Hungarian riot police fired tear gas and turned water cannons on uh, refugees yesterday as a key crossing point into the European Union became a battleground. Moving to the USA, the USA Today says the celebrity billionaire who showed in the first Republican debate six weeks ago that he ought to be taken seriously as a potential nominee walked on stage for the second debate yesterday, determined to demonstrate that now he should be taken seriously. Finally, in Israel, the Jerusalem Post reports that several hundred mourners attended the funeral of Alexander Levlevitz, who was killed on Monday after his car was stoned in Jerusalem's Armon Hanatzitz neighborhood while driving home with his two daughters after uh, celebrating Rosh Hashanah. Quick look at what's happening around the country today. We start here in Johannesburg. Of course, the trial of Nkululeko Flaba Habedi's girlfriend, Cindy Siwe Magnele, is expected to, she's expected to take to the stand again as the trial continues in the High Court. Then the High Court in Pretoria is expected to deliver judgment in the trial of a police officer accused of shooting and killing three protesters near Brits. That was in January of last year. Warrant Officer Hyde Moposo is facing charges of murder, attempted murder, and contravening the firearms Control Act. Then in the Western Cape, organizers of the upcoming Pharrell Williams Woolworths concert have launched an urgent application in the High Court to prevent a planned protest by boycott, divestment and sanctions. That's BDS South Africa at the Grand West Arena. BDS has urged Woolworths on a number of occasions to terminate their trade with Israel. Should be interesting what happens there.
Time for us to take a break. You're watching News and We on SABC News. Mavis from Zimbabwe examines female challenges using art to address them. I'm not very good at talking privately, but I'm very good at expressing myself through paints. Cape Town Fashion Week showcases brilliant designs. I'm trying to kind of contemporize the template, so to speak, of the East African Kanga, so that is our trademark. The animal farm story takes you down memory lane. They're making a film about animal farm. A film? A, a, a what you call a documentary. A what? A film, Muriel. They are from the BBC. How could you let this be? I just need time to see. I wanna be. My whole message is, is, has always been about love. You know what I'm saying? Just love, respect, and be honest. Join Rifulo Mulo on your one-stop arts and entertainment show every Saturday on Afro Showbiz News at 7.30 p.m. Welcome back. This is Newsroom. The ANC in the Northern Cape is getting its election machinery ready ahead of the 2016 local government elections. The ruling party's two-day local government summit in Kimberley ends today. Addressing get delegates on the first day of the summit, Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa said, We councillors are alienating the electorate from the party. Ramaphosa has urged councillors to go back to basics to avoid being punished at the polls. The Northern Cape was also affected by service delivery protests in recent time. Now, our reporter Margaret Motivi is covering the summit in Kimberley. Uh, she's standing by with the Northern Cape MEC for local government. A very good morning to you, Margaret. Uh, before you do the interview, just set the scene quickly for us. Good morning, Yevan. Like yesterday, we're still at the Mitas Pere Pere Convention Center here in Kimberley, and you rightfully indicated in your intro that the reason why we're here is because the ANC has decided to hold a provincial local government summit because it deemed it fit that it, it educates its councillors, its mayors, and municipal managers ahead of the 2016 local government elections. Yesterday, you said in your intro that the deputy president was here. He spoke to the delegates that are all gathered here in terms of getting ready ahead of the elections next year. Some of the key issues that he touched on is the fact that the councillors need to be doing the work that they were elected to do. Initially when they were elected, they were elected as people who know the community, people who are willing to work with the community. But it happens that sometimes when people get elected in these positions, they forget why they are elected and as a result they alienate the electorate and people do punish the ANC ultimately at the polls. So he his call was for them to go back to what they need to be doing in terms of going back to the basics. Um, we were supposed to speak to the MEC of local government, Elvin Bortes, but it has been decided that we speak um, this morning to the Secretary General of the ANC, Mr. Zamani So, who will speak into, into the issues that the, the Deputy President raised, whether they were at all able to go back into commissions to speak about those issues and iron them out and to get um, the councillors ready as they go back after today to, to the wards or the, the communities where they are working. Um, Mr. So, can you just speak to us? Yesterday the the, the deputy president made it quite clear that the ANC should go back into when they, they employ people, that they should employ people with skill, with qualification, that we should move away from deploying people because of friendships, because we know each other. Is that a problem in the Northern Cape? No. Yesterday, what happened after the address by the deputy president, we broke into commissions. And there is general and principled commitment by all the councillors who are here that they will have to go back to their municipalities and fight against patronage, which is an instance where when there's opportunities in the municipalities, those opportunities get ditched to people who are very closer to leadership. 
We also have commitment here from ANC councillors that they will have to go back and liquidate corrupt activities in their municipalities. We want to ensure to see clean municipalities which are not riddled by corrupt activities. There is also a commitment that councillors must strengthen the relationship between communities and the municipalities. Those are the three basic commitments which were made based on the input of, by the Deputy President. And also the second issue was the issue of funds. To, to, he emphasized the fact that public funds do not belong to councillors and municipal managers, yeah. that they belong to the community. Yeah. Is it something that you as a Northern Cape are taking serious and are looking into? That is something that we are taking very seriously, taking to cognizance that 40 percent of the people of the Northern Cape are living in conditions of poverty. So there is no self-respecting organization, and particularly the African National Congress, that can tolerate a situation where money is siphoned out of the municipality into pockets of private individuals. Each and every cent that is there in the municipal coffers must be used to ensure that we improve the quality of lives of our people. The commitment that we got yesterday, a principled commitment that we got yesterday, that we are going to liquidate corruption, we are going to expose those who are involved in corrupt activities. And the last question, what happens from here? Today is the last day you're closing. In terms of practical steps, what are the people supposed to do when they get back home? You, you, you must just bear in mind that this is the last lap. Uh, local government elections are less than 10 months from now. What we are going to be doing today is to come up with a practical program that has to be implemented in each and every municipality from now up until next year June. That is what will be happening today. We broke into commissions yesterday, and today we are supposed to come up with a practical program to ensure that we are going to achieve the objectives that we've set for ourselves to fight corruption, to close and strengthen the relationship between municipalities and communities, to fasten service delivery, and also to ensure that we strengthen our communication with, with communities. Thank you very much. That was um, the Secretary General of the ANC here in the province, Mr. Zamani So. Um, the ANC has made it quite clear that for next year's elections, they're going for 70 percent. They want 70 percent of the people voting in the Northern Cape to vote ANC. And they also want control of all the 32 municipalities in the Northern Cape. Back to you in the studio. Thank you very much. Margaret Matibi coming to you live there from Kimberley in Northern Cape where that uh, two-day local government summit is going on. Of course, it ends today now. Five people have been killed and a million residents have been evacuated following an 8.3 magnitude earthquake that rocked Chile. The Chilean President Michel Bachelet confirmed that two women were killed after rubble fell down on them and a man died of a heart attack. A tsunami warning has also been issued across most of the country as well as in Hawaii, New Zealand, Peru and parts of California in the United States. At SABC Newsroom is where, you, uh, is, is where you can interact with us. Don't forget these are some of the pictures but let's get some of the views of what happened or what happened. They're shocked after what happened in the Chile. May all be fine soon, says Abimanyu. Saruj says, heartfelt thoughts and prayers for everybody in Chile that's been affected by this devastating earthquake, Chile earthquake. Uh, he says, there we have a picture of a flooded home and, uh, well, real damage in the streets of uh, the city of, uh, well, it looks like Santiago, I would think. Yes, there you have uh, devastation after that 8.3 magnitude earthquake in Chile. There you can see bridge co bridges collapsed and so forth. Really big earthquake that struck there. More than a million people have been evacuated, I can tell you now. Let's take a look at what's happening on News and Facebook page this morning. Oscar Pistorius' lawyer, Barry Rue, has told the Supreme Court of Appeal that his client cannot afford a new deal, a new trial, mind you. That's our question of the day also. He says it would take too, be too long and complex for him. Then there have been mixed reactions to government's failed bid to appeal a decision that it acted unconstitutionally with regards to Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir's departure from South Africa earlier this year. And at least three people were killed when well, it's five now when a magnitude 8.3 earthquake hit off the coast of Chile yesterday. Uh, buildings were shaken in the capital of Santiago, flooding most of the coastal areas. There's also a tsunami warning that's been issued now. For more updates, you can go to our Facebook page. Of course, on Facebook, put in SABC Newsroom. We pop up, you like our page, and all the latest updates come.
Time for us to take a break though. When we come back, we look at albinism awareness and we also be live at the Liderex Summit here in Santon in Johannesburg. Art is an expression like no other. Sculpture speaks a language that painting and other two-dimensional plastic art cannot reproduce. Maybe this is because sculpture points to something beyond itself in a way a poem does. Professor Peter Gandul's passion for Africa underpins his sculptural language. I am the one that hallucinates in forms. I hallucinate shapes. I hallucinate my sculptures. I chew bones. I grind stones. I melt metal. I walk through the dense forest of ugliness in order to create the beauty of the universe, a universe of myself. The Nairox Sculpture Park is undeniably one of Gauteng's, if not South Africa's most incredible gardens. We visited the Winter Fair. And lastly, the James Hall Museum boasts beautiful vehicles that you wish you could take home. That's Kaleidoscope on Sunday at half past five. Welcome back, you're watching News Room on SABC News. Let's just take a look at the stories making headlines today. The 8.3 magnitude earthquake that has struck off the coast of Chile has left five people dead and a million evacuated. A tsunami alert has been issued to areas including Peru, Ecuador and Hawaii. Oscar Pistorius' financial ability for a new trial is non-existent. This is according to the Paralympic athletes' legal team. In papers filed with the Supreme Court of Appeal yesterday, Pistorius' lawyer Barry Rue argued his client cannot afford a new trial. The heads of argument were filed in response to the state's argument that the athlete should be found guilty of murder for shooting dead his girlfriend, Eva Stienkamp. And the United Nations Security Council has strongly condemned the detention of Burkina Faso's interim president and prime minister by presidential guard members. The detention has triggered immediate street protests outside the presidential palace. The move comes less than a month before an election. Well, remember, you can find all of those stories on our Newsroom Facebook page. Just simply search for SABC Newsroom. Of course, you can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Evan, back to you. Thank you very much. And in our September is Albinism Awareness Month. And so very often people with albinism are stigmatized, victimized, and even killed for their body parts. On Tuesday, a Malayan teacher suspected of attempting to sell an albino schoolgirl for 10,000 US dollars was arrested then here yeah, in KwaZulu Natal. Two men were sentenced to 20 years each for murdering an albino woman. Tomorrow, the Albinism Renaissance Forum of Southern Africa will be launching and celebrating Southern Africa's first ever albinism awareness campaign, which will celebrate talents and achievements of people with albinism and, well, to join the struggle against the challenges that they face. The launch will take place uh, in the West Rand District Municipality. Now to tell us more about the campaign, well, we are joined by Masilo Tampe, who is the ambassador for the Albinism Renaissance Forum of Southern Africa. Very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Uh, thank you, my brother, for hosting us. Albinism very much in the news at the moment. Tell us firstly about uh, the campaign that will be launching tomorrow. What is it and why is it important? Uh, about last year, we established uh, an NPO called Albinism Renaissance Forum, which you just alluded. 
uh, the reason we established that is because a num it's because of a, of a number of factors. Amongst those, it's a, as you have alluded, it's discrimination, hmm. it's prejudice, it's a, a society, lack of society with regard to understanding as mm -hmm. to uh, how does it, how, how, how do you become a child with albinism and whatnot and so forth. Now, we thought to ourselves that because of the challenges that we went through as children, we need to be able to uh, converse society, uh, lobby society, engage society around the subject of albinism so that they can understand and be able to, to, to accept uh, pe people with living with albinism uh, in our country. In the main, that is the concept behind uh, establishment of this. Mm. But over and above, the challenges that we are facing uh, varies f from uh, skin care uh, to optical, uh, 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 in fact, eye, 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 eye challenges. You realize that we have low vision of. Yeah. So it's important that you also lobby and engage different optical uh, companies uh, and uh, pharmacist companies to be able to assist to look after uh, our people so that uh, they don't get uh, victimized, but over and above that, uh, their confidence is uplifted. September is Albinism Month, yeah. uh, but, but it's also Heritage Month and, and a whole lot of other months. Do, do you think enough is being done uh, to create awareness of the plight of people living with albinism, not just in South Africa, but in other African countries? In fact, my brother, uh, from where I'm sitting, I don't think much, I don't think uh, a lot has been done on this issue. Why am I saying that? You can't, September is a clouded month, mm. tour tourism month, heritage month, uh, and then you want to put it with albinism. Mm. Uh, it, it, it will really take, uh, 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 it, it becomes very difficult for, for us to get our message across. Now, I think that government must be able to take an active step in probably changing either the month, number one, number two, uh, be able to engage as to how far can it go mm. to assist people with uh, living with albinism, but also to, to assist us when we develop these particular campaigns uh, to be part of them. Because uh, it's here and there where you find a particular assistance mm. and, and, and uh, 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 guidance uh, from other institutions not only government. Yes. The, the United Nations has declared albinism as a, a disability. Yes. How do you feel about that? And is it really recognized as such? That thing <laughs> it is currently a serious debate. Uh, it, it will continue a debate. Uh, at first, when I heard about that uh, we are uh, declared as dis disabled people, I was a bit unstable. Hmm. But given the the fact that many people living with albinism, for instance, those who are born in rural areas with challenges and whatnot, with the South African system giving, uh, issuing out grants, when you declare a child with uh, albinism disabled, automatically that child can be able to benefit in the grant system mm. so that the parents can be able to buy sunscreens, can be able to afford, because I can tell you a child with albinism is quite expensive. Mm. So it is important. In that light, uh, with the benefits that is there, I think uh, we can accept the, the, the subject yeah. as, as, as that. But over and above that, Africa on its own needs to engage on this particular matter. The, the United Nations would have declared uh, the 13th of June as the International Albinism Month. Yeah. But the African, the AU has not done anything with regard to this matter, has not engaged it does not even engage on this on this particular subject. Mm. Yet we are having atrocities in Malawi. We are having atrocities against persons with albinism in Tanzania, yeah. as you have alluded recently uh, in the KZN. So it's important that we get society engaged, our parliaments engaged. Well, I thank you for for joining us. Uh, we've run uh, we've we've run out of time. Of course, we we're talking to the Albinism Renaissance Forum of Southern Africa. Masilo Tampe, I thank you for joining us today to talk about the plight of uh, a people living with albinism, not just in South Africa, but wider on the continent. Thank you once again. Thank you very much for hosting us. Now, Africa's largest gathering of executives, professionals, and entrepreneurs 
Leader X 2015 is being held at the Santon Convention Center. Visitors will be able to connect with more than 200 exhibitors to, well, achieve their leadership, career and business goals. Leader X 2015 aims to develop world-class leaders and companies through 60 events, including conferences, debates, master classes and fora. Leader X is held at a time when the world economy is going through major challenges. Now, our, our e economics reporter, Nompumalela Siziba, is there. A very good morning to you, Nompu. Thank you for joining us. Thanks very much, Evan. An interesting... Now, um, as you say, uh, this is uh, the Leader X 20, 2015. Oh, carry on. What do you want to ask me, Evan? We've got a three-second delay, Nompu. Just carry on, set the scene for us before we get into the meat and drink of it. Okay, thanks very much, Yevon. Yes, well, this is the 2015 Leader X. Why is Leader X important? Well, it's all about promoting leadership and entrepreneurship. One of the things that's expected to boost the global economy, not just the African economy, is the boosting of small to medium enterprises. And that starts with the nucleus of an entrepreneur. And so not only do we need entrepreneurs, but we need great leaders. So here at uh, LeaderX, we've got, as you said, the biggest gathering of executives, professionals and entrepreneurs to basically intersect with each other, exchange ideas and uh, best find ways to ensure that they fulfill their potential. We've got academic institutions here. Um, you've got uh, Henley Business School, um, you've got Gibbs here, you've got other representation here. Um, we've got financial institutions who are there to play a significant role in terms of uh, providing finance to entrepreneurs. That's always a bugbear for small business. They always say it's hard to access finance. So we've got those types of institutions here. We've got about 20 coaches. Now coaches are real... Um, really skilled people in that they help uh, leaders, executives to tap into what they want to achieve and actually achieve it. So it's not mentoring, but it's a, it's a way of finding, helping people find their potential and do their best. So we've got those, about 20 of them, and this function is free of charge for the public. So people who are budding entrepreneurs or are already in the game, but want advice and want to speak to people who have already made it, are able to exchange ideas with these people here. Nompu, the world's economy has taken a bit of a nosedive and, and the outlook isn't very good for the next uh, couple of years, it seems. What, what, what kind of discussions do you think will flow out at LeaderX because of this and, and the sort of kind of mitigation that one would have to look at? Yes, absolutely, Evan. Look, um, as I said before, you know, fundamentally, uh, it's the small business which is expected to actually uh, turn around the growth story that we've been seeing right across the globe, uh, and obviously here in South Africa and the rest of the continent. So some of the discussions that they'll be having is, how do you maximize your potential? How do you access finance? How do you ensure that you have the right strategy? How do you ensure that you go ahead and implement that strategy? All of those kinds of things, getting down to the bare nuts and bolts of entrepreneurship and uh, ensuring that you build a business that's viable and sustainable. These are some of the issues that they'll be talking to. Well, Numpu, it's a, it should be a very, interesting, uh, a very interesting couple of days. Thank you for joining us. We've run out of time, unfortunately, so we've got to go, but I'm sure you'll keep us updated over the next day or so what's been the outcomes, yeah? Absolutely, we will be doing so. I'm hoping to grab a couple of entrepreneurs who've made it and ask them how they did it so that the viewers who are watching, who are also perhaps budding entrepreneurs, can get good ideas as to the way forward. Thank you very much. Nompu Ziziba coming to you live from Santon Convention Center where LeaderX 2015 is taking place. Now, that's where I'm leaving this morning. Newsroom, of course, broadcast live from our studios here in Auckland Park, Johannesburg, every weekday morning between 9 and 10 a.m. Don't forget, we're also live on YouTube at that time with the whole show available on demand on our YouTube channel all day long. This is SABC News. You've been watching Newsroom. We'll have it in the morning. <laughs>